Throughout history, many people have claimed fraudulently to have been displaced monarchs or heirs who had disappeared or supposedly died under mysterious circumstances. Following the execution of the Russian imperial family, the House of Romanov, by a firing squad led by Yakov Yurovsky in Ekaterinburg, on the 17th of July 1918, several impostors began to appear in public, coming forward and claiming to have survived this execution. The descendants of some of these impostors continue to seek the return of their so-called legal name, or even the Russian imperial crown itself. According to various calculations, there have been around 230 Romanov impostors across the world who have enjoyed a degree of success among their believers. Their motivations and background vary, but include those who had significant interpersonal problems. Many impostors did not appear to come from a good life and were largely adventurers or people who wished to gain any privileges or claimed kinship with the Russian royal family. In May 1979, the remains of most of the Russian royal family and their retainers were found by amateur enthusiasts who kept the discovery secret until the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. In July 1991, the bodies of five family members, the Emperor Nicholas II, his wife and Empress Consort Alexandra, and three of their daughters, two of which were identified as Grand Duchess Olga and Grand Duchess Tatiana, were exhumed. However, the Tsarevich and heir, Alexei, and one of the two youngest daughters, either Grand Duchess Maria or Grand Duchess Anastasia, were still missing. For decades, conspiracy theorists suggested that one or more of the family somehow survived the slaughter. The discovery of only five members of the Russian imperial family served to further encourage these conspiracy theories. However, eventually on the 23rd of August 2007, a Russian archaeologist announced the discovery of two burned, partial skeletons at a bonfire site near Ekaterinburg that appeared to match the site described in Yakov Yurovsky's memoirs. On the 30th of April 2008, Russian forensic scientists announced that DNA testing had proven that the remains belonged to the Tsarevich Alexei and the Grand Duchess Maria. Between the execution of the Russian imperial family and the discovery of their remains, the world has known at least 81 Alexei impostors, 34 Anastasia impostors, 53 impostors who claim to be Maria, 33 Tatiana impostors, along with 28 Olga impostors and at least one impostor who claim to be Nicholas II himself. Their stories and allegations were so commonplace a Geneva Bank created an identification service, and none of the candidates could pass the exam. As well as this, some of the candidates were even unable to speak the Russian language. Of all the members of the Russian imperial family, Anastasia's survival stories have always been the most famous, inspiring dozens of books and films. And it is with the numerous impostors who claim to be Anastasia that we begin the first of our videos exploring the lives of those who tried to fool the world. These are the stories of the Romanov impostors. On the night of February the 17th, 1920, an unidentified woman attempted to commit suicide by throwing herself into the water from the Bendlerstrasse bridge into the Landwehr Canal in Berlin. A police sergeant on duty nearby managed to rescue the unknown woman, and she was admitted to the Elizabeth Hospital in the district of Berlin-Lichtenberg. 
The police made an inventory of the woman's clothes, which consisted of black stockings, black high boots, a black skirt, a rough dress without initials, a blouse and a large scarf. The unknown woman did not have any documents that could help in establishing her identity. As well as this, she was unresponsive when asked questions. As she was without papers and refused to identify herself, she was admitted as Miss Unknown to a mental hospital in Daldorf, now present-day Wittenau, where she remained for the next two years. The medical examination report stated that the patient was prone to severe bouts of melancholy and was seriously malnourished. The unknown patient had scars on her head and body and spoke German with an accent which was described as Russian by medical staff. Miss Unknown spent a year and a half in Daldorf. According to one of the nurses, the patient understood the questions addressed to her in Russian, but could not answer, which later made it possible to assume that her native language was some kind of Slavic, most likely Polish. However, information about whether the new patient spoke Russian and whether she could understand this language differ greatly. For example, Nurse Erna Buchholz, a former German teacher who had lived in Russia for quite some time, claimed that Miss Unknown spoke Russian, as in her native language, with coherent, correct sentences. During night duty, they had plenty of opportunities to talk, since the patient suffered from insomnia. Buchholz also recalled that she had told her about St. Basil's Cathedral, about Russian politics, and the unknown patient nodded her head affirmatively and declared that this was all familiar to her. However, the newspapers and books that the patient read were all in German. In addition, she presumably knew or understood the Polish language. The nurse Taya Malinowskaya, being of Polish origin, sometimes joked and talked to the patient in Polish. Although the girl herself never answered her in Polish, Malinowskaya thought that she perfectly understood the language. In general, the staff agreed that the patient appeared to be quite educated. Nurse Bertha Waltz recalled that Miss Unknown became visibly worried when a member of staff brought an illustrated magazine with a photo of the Russian royal family to the ward. Waltz claimed that when she pointed to one of Nicholas II's daughters and commented that she could have escaped, Miss Unknown corrected her and replied, no, not that one. However, there is also contrary evidence. The unknown woman also spoke freely about the German emperor and the heir to the throne, as if she knew them personally. It was also noted that the patient was prone to fantasizing and writing, so she assured that after leaving the clinic she would live in a villa and ride a horse. The impetus for the creation of the image of the imposter was her neighbor in the hospital room, Clara Puter who was a laundress and seamstress who allegedly suffered from persecution mania. Clara constantly felt that she was being spied on and robbed. Also, Clara claimed that, as a dressmaker, she supplied dresses to the ladies-in-waiting of the Russian Imperial Court. On the 23rd of October 1921, one of the nurses brought to the ward a fresh issue of the newspaper, Berlin Illustrated, with a photo of the Russian royal family. The photo was accompanied by a headline which asked, Is one of the royal daughters alive? According to Clara, she was intrigued by the apparent resemblance between the unnamed patient and the faces in the photo, but the patient only whispered, Be silent, in response. On the 22nd of January 1922, Clara was discharged from the clinic, but remaining firmly convinced that one of the four daughters of Nicholas II was hiding under the guise of Miss Unknown, she began to look for evidence. On the 5th of March 1922, Clara met with the former captain of the Imperial Cuirassier Regiment, 
Captain Nicholas von Schwab in the courtyard of the Berlin Orthodox Church and told him about her suspicions. She managed to persuade the captain to visit the unknown woman in the clinic and try to establish her true identity. On the 8th of March 1922, Nicholas von Schwab visited the unknown woman in Daldorf and showed her photographs of the Dowager Empress Maria Fedorovna. According to von Schwab, the patient replied that she did not know her. However, in a later recollection she would tell a different story from von Schwab, claiming that she identified her supposed grandmother in the photographs von Schwab showed her. Either way, Captain Schwab was left in doubt. To avoid a possible mistake, he persuaded Mrs. Zinaida Tolstoy, who was a friend of the Empress Consort Alexandra to visit the still unknown woman with him again. According to the memoirs of Schwab, Mrs. Tolstoy and her daughter talked for a long time with the patient, showed her some icons and whispered some names in her ear. The patient did not answer but was excited to tears. It was also not possible to examine her, as she stubbornly covered her face with a blanket. Without achieving a word, the visitors left, and Mrs. Tolstoy and her daughter were convinced that Grand Duchess Tatiana was the unidentified patient in the hospital. The news spread quickly among Russian emigrants, and on the 12th of March 1922, the patient was visited by Baroness Sophie Boxoedin. Her opinion was considered especially important, as she was one of the last to have met with the family of the deposed emperor. The Baroness parted ways with the Romanovs just a month and a half before the execution. The Baroness recalled that the stranger showed her usual timidity and distrust, keeping silent in response to questions, trying only to cover her face with her hands and a blanket. Like Mrs. Tolstoy, Baroness Sophie was also convinced that the patient was Grand Duchess Tatiana, suffering from amnesia as a result of shock. The Baroness tried to revive her memory by showing an icon with the dates of the Romanov's reign. Clara Puter, in turn, brought a photograph of the royal family and, pointing her finger at the Empress Consort Alexandra, asked her if she was her mother. Later, having persuaded her companions to leave, Baroness Sophie spoke to the unknown woman in English, a language that Grand Duchess Tatiana knew perfectly well, and despite the fact that, apparently, the stranger did not understand a word, she finally showed her face. After seeing her entire face, Baroness Sophie's conclusion was categorical. Her forehead and eyes reminded me of Grand Duchess Tatiana, but it was worth seeing the whole face, so that the resemblance ceased to seem so striking. Although the upper part of the face is somewhat similar to Grand Duchess Tatiana, I am still sure that it is not her. Later I found out that she pretends to be Anastasia, but there is absolutely no external resemblance to the Grand Duchess, no special features that would allow anyone who knew Anastasia intimately to be convinced of the truth of her words. By the way, I note that Grand Duchess Anastasia hardly knew a dozen German words, and pronounced them with an incredible Russian accent. The next guest of the patient was Baroness Maria von Kleist, the wife of Baron Arthur von Kleist, who had formerly been a police chief in Russian Poland prior to the downfall of Nicholas II. On the 22nd of March 1922, the von Kleists obtained permission from the hospital authorities to settle the unknown woman in their house. To the surprise of Maria von Kleist, when she came for the stranger, she saw that the patient was pulling out her hair and was already missing many teeth. The unknown woman claimed that her teeth had been damaged after a blow to the face while in captivity in Ekaterinburg. The Berlin policeman who handled the case, Detective Inspector Franz Grunberg, 
thought that Kleist may have had ulterior motives. Grunberg suspected that if the old conditions should ever be restored in Russia, Kleist would hope for great advancement from having looked after the young woman. The unknown woman soon began calling herself Anna Tchaikovsky, choosing Anna as a short form of Anastasia, although Clara Puter described her everywhere as Anastasia. The now self-styled Anna Tchaikovsky stayed in the houses of acquaintances, including the Kleists, Puter, a poor working-class family called Bachmann, and at Inspector Grunberg's estate near Zossen. At his estate, Grunberg arranged for the sister of the Empress Consort Alexandra, Princess Irene of Hesse and by Rhine, to meet Anna Tchaikovsky, but Princess Irene did not recognize her. However, this did not stop Anna from supposedly making a confession to Baron Arthur von Kleist. The stranger openly called herself Grand Duchess Anastasia, the youngest daughter of Nicholas II. The Baron asked her how she had managed to escape, to which the reply followed. Yes, I was with everyone on the night of the murder, and when the massacre began, I hid behind my sister Tatiana, who was shot. I fainted from a few blows. When I regained consciousness, I found myself in the house of some soldier who had saved me. By the way, I went to Romania with his wife, and when she died, I decided to sneak into Germany alone. However, in conversations with Mrs. Tolstoy, Anna added new details to her story, and Arthur von Kleist recorded it from the words of Mrs. Tolstoy as follows. On August 2nd of this year, a woman who calls herself Grand Duchess Anastasia told her that she was saved from death by a Russian soldier, Alexander Tchaikovsky. With his family, his mother Maria, sister Veronechka and brother Sergei, Anastasia Nikolaevna came to Bucharest and remained there until 1920. By Tchaikovsky she bore a child, a boy who should be about three years old now. In 1920, when Tchaikovsky was killed in a street shootout, she, without saying a word to anyone, fled Bucharest and reached Berlin. The child, according to her, remained with the Tchaikovskys, and she begged for help to find him. The Duchess of Luchtenberg, who met Anna in 1927, commented. She was very cunning. One day she was asked, remember, you had a porcelain dog on the fireplace, and the next day she said to another visitor, I remember we had a porcelain dog on the fireplace. According to Greg King and Penny Wilson, authors of The Fate of the Romanovs, all 11 people responsible for the shooting of the royal family have been identified, along with all of the guards at the Ipative house where they were held captive. None of them bore the name Tchaikovsky, contrary to the claims made by Anna. No evidence of the existence of the people she claimed to be her saviors were found. A few days later, Anna, without saying goodbye, left the Kleists. She was received by Clara Puter, but after a few days, having quarreled with the hostess because of an article about her in a newspaper, Anna left Puter as well. For a few days she was sheltered by neighbors. The Baron and Baroness von Kleist did not wish to resettle Anna. According to some sources, they were convinced of her imposterism, and according to others they were exhausted with a sick woman who had a bad character. Dr. Grunberg, as he recounts in his memoirs, decided to take steps to officially establish Anna's true identity. Opponents of Anna saw in this a direct hint that the German government decided to train an imposter for the role of Grand Duchess and then use it for some political purposes, but subsequent events speak rather against such an assumption. Anna was by no means happy about Princess Irene's visit to Dr. Grunberg's estate near Zossen. According to Dr. Grunberg's memoirs, during dinner, we seated Anastasia in front of Her Highness, so that the princess could get a good look at her. It should be noted, 
however, that the princess last saw the imperial family about ten years ago. After dinner, Anastasia retired to her room, the princess followed her in the hope of having a private conversation and celebrating a familiar trait. But Anastasia felt very bad that evening and was, no more, however, than usual, not disposed to conversations. She turned her back to the princess and did not answer her a word. Her behavior is all the more inexplicable because she recognized the princess at first sight, the next morning she told us that yesterday's visitor was her Aunt Irene. The princess herself recalled this story somewhat differently. At the end of August 1922, at the request of advisor Gable and police inspector Dr. Grunberg, I agreed to come to Berlin to see a mysterious woman calling herself my niece Anastasia. Dr. Grunberg took me and Mrs. Erzen to his country house near Berlin, where a stranger lived under the name Mademoiselle Annie. I was immediately convinced that it couldn't be one of my nieces, although I hadn't seen them in nine years, something distinctive about their facial features couldn't have changed that much. At first glance, the stranger looked a bit like Grand Duchess Tatiana. To the great disappointment of the Grunberg couple, so disposed to a stranger, I left their house in the firm conviction that this was not my niece, I had no illusions about this. In the end, Dr. Grunberg also gave up caring for Anna. Either he was finally convinced of her imposterism and lost all interest, or he was exhausted caring for a mentally ill woman with a difficult character. In a letter to Advisor Berg, he himself presents his conclusions regarding the case of Anna sincerely and very simply. In my reflections, I got to a dead end. Anastasia is by no means an adventurer. It seems to me that the poor girl just went crazy and imagined herself the daughter of the Russian Emperor. Advisor Berg proposed that Anna be entrusted with the care of Harriet von Raffleff, a Baltic German by birth, writer and sculptor. As it turned out later, the choice was exceptionally successful. Raffleff became a friend, nurse and most loyal supporter of Anna. Harriet von Raffleff recalls her first impressions. Her movements, her posture, her manners betrayed in her a lady of high society. Those are my first impressions. But what struck me the most was the resemblance of a young woman to an empress dowager. She spoke German, but with a distinct Russian accent, and when I addressed her in Russian, she understood me quite well, because although she answered me in German, her remarks were accurate. Any direct questions frightened her, she was withdrawing into herself. It was not easy to call her for a conversation, but then it was necessary to try not to interfere with her, interrupting her with remarks. If the subject of the conversation was interesting to her, she spoke quite willingly. This was almost always the case when it came to her childhood years, living with her parents, brother and sisters seemed to be the only thing that interested her, memories overwhelmed her in these moments. She knew how to be grateful for the kindness and friendship she was shown. From all her nature there was a whiff of nobility and dignity that attracted everyone who got acquainted with her. Opponents of Anna wondered why such obvious signs did not catch the eye of anyone except Harriet von Raffleff. For many years, Raffleff became a nurse, confidant and chief admirer of Anna. But, despite all the care, she had to experience the capricious and gloomy nature of the patient. As Raffleff bitterly recalled, Anna, as soon as she was in the spotlight, began to behave like a lord in the worst sense if the word. Around this time, information about the unknown woman, posing as Grand Duchess Anastasia, leaked to the press and reached Denmark, where the Dowager Empress Maria Fyodorovna, who was the mother of Nicholas II, resided. The Danish envoy to Berlin, Mr. Zale, 
on the orders of King Christian X of Denmark, became the intermediary between Raflev and the Danish royal court. As Dowager Empress Maria's letters show, she was quite wary of Anna's confessions, and yet decided not to neglect the chance, no matter how small it was. Therefore, Alexei Volkov, the former room servant of Alexandra Fyodorovna, the only one who managed to escape from Ekaterinburg, went to Berlin on her behalf. The testimony of the former servant is difficult to overestimate, as he was one of the last to see Grand Duchess Anastasia when she was alive. Three accounts of Volkov's encounters with the unknown woman have been preserved. The first of them, the shortest in volume, belongs to Advisor Berg. He writes the following. I remember in detail how Mrs. Tchaikovsky met with a former servant of the Imperial Court. Volkov spoke only Russian, so I can't judge too much. At first he was extremely cold and even with some suspicion, but the next day he seemed to change his mind, for he had become remarkably polite and was moved to tears when it was time to leave. In the end, Berg concludes, Alexei Volkov publicly announced that he cannot claim that she is not a Grand Duchess. The second account, the most verbose, belongs to the hand of Harriet von Raffleff. He kissed her hand several times. Completely touched, he said everything will be fine, and slowly left the room. In the doorway, he turned around again, tears rolling down his cheeks. I went out to see him off and he told me, try to understand my situation. If I say it's her, now that others have said the opposite so many times, I'm going to be found crazy. I am far from judging someone, but one bold voice would be much more useful for the patient than all the hints and timid confirmations, which, apparently, our destiny was to listen to. And finally, it is necessary to cite an excerpt from the report of Alexei Volkov himself, presented by him to the Dowager Empress Maria Fyodorovna. I did not get to Mrs. Tchaikovsky without difficulty. On my first visit, I was not allowed to speak to her, and I was forced to be content with looking at her from the window, however, even this was enough for me to make sure that this woman had nothing to do with the late Grand Duchess Anastasia. I decided to finish the job and asked for another meeting with her. We saw each other the next day, I asked her if she recognized me, she said no. I asked her a lot more questions, the answers were equally substantiated. The behavior of the people surrounding Mrs. Tchaikovsky seemed to me rather suspicious. They incessantly intervened in the conversation, sometimes answered for her and explained any mistake by the poor health of my interlocutor. Once again I must confirm, and in the most categorical way, that Mrs. Tchaikovsky has nothing to do with Grand Duchess Anastasia. If she knows any facts from the life of the Imperial family, she has gleaned them exclusively from books, in addition, her familiarity with the subject looks very superficial. This remark of mine is confirmed by the fact that she never mentioned any details other than those the press wrote about. As well as Alexei Volkov, Anna Tchaikovsky was visited in 1925 by Anastasia's former tutor Pierre Gilliard, along with his wife Alexandra Tegliva, who had been Anastasia's nursemaid, and Nicholas II's sister Grand Duchess Olga. Although they expressed sympathy, it was only for the tuberculous infection from which Anna was suffering from at the time, and they made no immediate public declarations. Eventually, they all denied that Anna Tchaikovsky was Grand Duchess Anastasia. In March 1926, she convalesced in Lugano, Switzerland with Harriet von Raffleff at the expense of Grand Duchess Anastasia's great-uncle, Prince Valdemar of Denmark. Valdemar was willing to offer Tchaikovsky material assistance through the Danish ambassador to Germany, while her identity was investigated. To allow her to travel, 
The Berlin Aliens Office issued her with a temporary certificate of identity under the name Anastasia Tchaikovsky with Grand Duchess Anastasia's personal details. After a quarrel with Raflev, Anna was moved to a sanatorium at Oberstdorf in the Bavarian Alps in June 1926, and Raflev returned to Berlin. At Oberstdorf, Anna Tchaikovsky was visited by Tatiana Melnik. Melnik was the niece of Serge Bakin, the head of the Russian refugee office in Berlin, and the daughter of the imperial family's personal physician, Dr. Eugene Botkin, who had been murdered alongside the imperial family in Ekaterinburg in 1918. Tatiana Melnik had met Grand Duchess Anastasia as a child and had last spoken to her in February 1917. To Melnik, Anna Tchaikovsky looked like Grand Duchess Anastasia, even though she claimed her mouth had changed and coarsened noticeably. Melnik declared that Tchaikovsky was Anastasia, and supposed that any inability on her part to remember events and her refusal to speak Russian was caused by her impaired physical and psychological condition. Either inadvertently through a sincere desire to aid the patient's weak memory, or as part of a deliberate charade, Melnik coached Tchaikovsky with details of life in the imperial family. In 1927, under pressure from his family, Prince Valdemar decided against providing Anna Tchaikovsky with any further financial support, and the funds from Denmark were cut off. Duke George of Luchtenberg, a distant relative of Nicholas II, gave her a home at Castle Sion. The brother of Empress Consort Alexandra, Ernest Louis, Grand Duke of Hesse, hired a private detective, Martin Knopf, to investigate the claims that Tchaikovsky was Anastasia. During her stay at Castle Sion, Knopf reported that Anna Tchaikovsky was actually a Polish factory worker named Franciska Szanskowska. Franciska had worked in a munitions factory during the First World War, when, shortly after her fiancé had been killed at the front, a grenade fell out of her hand and exploded. She had been injured in the head, and a factory foreman was killed in front of her. She became apathetic and depressed, was declared insane on September 19, 1916, and spent time in two lunatic asylums. In early 1920, she was reported missing from her Berlin lodgings, and since then had not been seen or heard from by her family. In May 1927, Franziska's brother Felix was introduced to Tchaikovsky at a local inn in Wasserburg near Castle Sion. Luchtenberg's son, Dmitri, was completely certain that Tchaikovsky was an imposter and that she was recognized by Felix as his sister, but Luchtenberg's daughter, Natalie, remained convinced of Tchaikovsky's authenticity. Luchtenberg himself was ambivalent. According to one account, initially Felix declared that Anna Tchaikovsky was his sister Franziska, but the affidavit he signed spoke only of a strong resemblance, highlighted physical differences, and said she did not recognize him. Years later, Felix's family said that he knew Anna Tchaikovsky was his sister, but he had chosen to leave her to her new life, which was far more comfortable than any alternative. Visitors to Castle Sion included Prince Felix Yusupov, husband of Princess Irina Alexandrovna of Russia, who wrote, I claim categorically that she is not Anastasia Nikolaevna, but just an adventuress, a sick hysteric and a frightful play actress. I simply cannot understand how anyone can be in doubt of this. If you had seen her, I am convinced that you would recoil in horror at the thought that this frightful creature could be a daughter of our Tsar. Other visitors, such as Felix Dassel, an officer whom Anastasia had visited in hospital during 1916, and Gleb Botkin, who had known Anastasia as a child and was Tatiana Melnik's brother, were convinced that Anna Tchaikovsky was genuine. 
By 1928, Tchaikovsky's claim had received interest and attention in the United States, where Gleb Botkin had published articles in support of her cause. Botkin's publicity caught the attention of a distant cousin of Anastasia's, Xenia Leeds, a former Russian princess who had married a wealthy American industrialist. Botkin and Leeds had arranged for Anna Tchaikovsky to travel to the United States at Leeds' expense. On the journey from Castle Sion to the United States, Anna stopped at Paris, where she met Grand Duke Andrei Vladimirovich of Russia, Nicholas II's cousin, who believed her to be Anastasia. For six months, Anna Tchaikovsky lived at the estate of the Leeds family in Oyster Bay, New York. As the 10th anniversary of Nicholas II's execution approached in July 1928, Botkin retained a lawyer, Edward Fallows, to oversee legal moves to obtain any of Nicholas II's estate outside of the Soviet Union. As the emperor's death had never been proved at the time, the estate could only be released to relatives ten years after the supposed date of his death. Fallows set up a company, which sought to raise funds by selling shares in any prospective estate. Anna Tchaikovsky claimed that Nicholas II had deposited money abroad, which fed unsubstantiated rumors of a large Romanov fortune in England. The surviving relatives of the Romanovs accused Botkin and Fallows of fortune hunting, and Botkin accused them of trying to defraud Anastasia out of her inheritance. Except from a relatively small deposit in Germany, distributed to Nicholas II's recognized relations, no money was ever found. After a quarrel, possibly over Anna Tchaikovsky's claim to the estate, Anna moved out of the Leeds's mansion, and the pianist Sergei Rachmaninoff arranged for her to live at the Garden City Hotel in New York, and later in a small cottage. To avoid the press, she was booked in as Anna Anderson, the name by which she was subsequently known. In October 1928, after the death of Nicholas II's mother, the Dowager Empress Maria, the twelve nearest relations of Nicholas II met at Maria's funeral and signed a declaration that Anna Anderson, or Anna Tchaikovsky, was an impostor. The Copenhagen Statement, as it would come to be known, explained, Our sense of duty compels us to state that the story is only a fairy tale. The memory of our dear departed would be tarnished if we allowed this fantastic story to spread and gain any credence. Gleb Bakken answered with a public letter to Grand Duchess Xenia, which referred to the family as greedy and unscrupulous and claimed they were only denouncing Anna Anderson for money. From early 1929, Anna Anderson lived with Annie Bird Jennings, a wealthy Park Avenue spinster happy to host someone she supposed to be the daughter of the Russian Emperor. For 18 months, Anderson was the toast of New York City society. Then a pattern of self-destructive behavior began that culminated in her throwing tantrums, killing her pet parakeet, and on one occasion running around naked on the roof. On the 24th of July 1930, Judge Peter Schmuck of the New York Supreme Court signed an order committing her to a mental hospital. Before she could be taken away, Anderson locked herself in her room, and the door was broken in with an axe. She was forcibly taken to the Four Wind Sanatorium in Westchester County, New York, where she remained for slightly over a year. In August 1931, Anderson returned to Germany accompanied by a private nurse in a locked cabin. Jennings paid for the voyage, the stay at the Westchester Sanatorium, and an additional six months' care in the psychiatric wing of a nursing home near Hanover. On arrival at the nursing home, Anderson was assessed as sane, but as the room was prepaid, and she had nowhere else to go, she stayed on in a suite in the sanatorium grounds. 
Anna Anderson's return to Germany generated press interest and drew more members of the German aristocracy to her cause. She again lived as a guest of her well-wishers. In 1932, British tabloid News of the World published a sensational story accusing her of being a Romanian actress who was perpetrating a fraud. Her lawyer, Fallows, filed suit for libel, but the lengthy case continued until the outbreak of the Second World War, at which time the case was dismissed because Anderson was living in Germany and German residents could not sue in enemy countries. From 1938, lawyers acting for Anderson in Germany contested the distribution of Nicholas II's estate to his recognized relations, and they in turn contested her identity. The litigation continued intermittently without resolution for decades, and Lord Mountbatten footed some of his German relations legal bills against Anderson. The protracted proceedings became the longest-running lawsuit in German history. Anderson had a final meeting with the Skanskowski family in 1938. Gertrude Schanskowska was insistent that Anderson was her sister, Franziska, but the Nazi government had arranged the meeting to determine Anderson's identity, and if accepted as Schanskowska she would be imprisoned. The Skanskowski family refused to sign affidavits against her, and no further action was taken. In 1940, Edward Fallows died virtually destitute after wasting all his own money on trying to obtain Nicholas II's non-existent fortune. Towards the end of the Second World War, Anderson lived at Schloss Winterstein in what would become the Soviet occupation zone. In 1946, Prince Frederick of Saxe-Altenburg helped her across the border to the French occupation zone. Prince Frederick settled Anderson in a former army barracks in a small village at the end of the Black Forest, where she became a sort of tourist attraction. Lily Den, a friend of the Empress Consort Alexandra, visited her and acknowledged her as Anastasia, but when Charles Sidney Gibbs, English tutor to the Imperial children, met Anderson he denounced her as a fraud. In an affidavit, he swore that she in no way resembled the true Grand Duchess Anastasia that he had known. Anna Anderson became a recluse, surrounded by cats, and her house began to decay. In May 1968, Anderson was taken to hospital after being discovered semi-conscious in her cottage. In her absence, Prince Frederick cleaned up the property by order of the local board of health. Her Irish wolfhound and 60 cats were put to death. Horrified by this, Anderson accepted her long-term supporter Gleb Botkin's offer to move back to the United States. Botkin was living in the university town of Charlottesville, Virginia, and a local friend of his, history professor and genealogist John Manahan, paid for Anderson's journey to the United States. She entered the country on a six-month visitor's visa, and shortly before it was due to expire, Anderson married Manahan, who was 20 years her junior, in a civil ceremony on the 23rd of December 1968. Botkin was best man. Manahan enjoyed this marriage of convenience and described himself as Grand Duke in waiting or son-in-law to the Tsar. The couple lived in separate bedrooms in a house on University Circle in Charlottesville and also owned a farm near Scottsville. Botkin died in December 1969. In February of the following year, 1970, the lawsuits finally came to an end, with neither side able to establish Anderson's identity. Manahan and Anderson, now legally called Anastasia Manahan, became well known in the Charlottesville area as eccentrics. Though Manahan was wealthy, they lived in squalor with large numbers of dogs and cats, and piles of garbage. On the 20th of August 1979, 
Anderson was taken to Charlottesville's Martha Jefferson Hospital with an intestinal obstruction. With both Manahan and Anderson in failing health, in November 1983, Anderson was institutionalized, and an attorney, William Preston, was appointed as her guardian by the local circuit court. A few days later, Manahan kidnapped Anderson from the hospital, and for three days they drove around Virginia eating out of convenience stores. After a 13-state police alarm, they were found and Anderson was returned to a care facility. In January 1984, she was thought to have had a stroke, and on the 12th of February 1984, she died of pneumonia. She was cremated the same day, and her ashes were buried in the churchyard at Castle Sion on the 18th of June 1984. Manahan died on the 22nd of March 1990. A sample of Anna Anderson's tissue had been stored at Martha Jefferson Hospital in Charlottesville, Virginia. Anderson's DNA was extracted from the sample and compared with that of the Romanovs and their relatives. It did not match that of the Duke of Edinburgh or that of the Bones, confirming that Anderson was not related to the Romanovs. However, the sample matched DNA provided by Karl Macher a grandson of Francisca Shanskowska's sister, Gertrude, indicating that Karl Macher and Anna Anderson were related and that Anderson was Shanskowska. Although communists had murdered the entire Imperial Romanov family in July 1918, including 17-year-old Grand Duchess Anastasia, for years afterwards communist disinformation fed rumors that members of the family survived. The conflicting rumors about the fate of the family allowed imposters to make spurious claims that they were a surviving Romanov. Most of the imposters were dismissed, however, Anna Anderson's claim persisted. Conflicting testimonies and physical evidence, such as comparisons of facial characteristics, which alternately supported and contradicted Anderson's claim, were used either to bolster or to counter the belief that she was Anastasia. In the absence of any direct documentary proof or solid physical evidence, the question of whether Anderson was Anastasia was for many a matter of personal belief. The German courts were unable to decide her claim one way or another, and eventually, after 40 years of deliberation, ruled that her claim was neither established nor refuted. Assessments vary as to whether Anderson was a deliberate imposter, delusional, traumatized into adopting a new identity, or someone used by her supporters for their own ends. Pierre Gilliard denounced Anderson as a cunning psychopath. The equation of Anderson with members of the imperial family began with Clara Puter in the Daldorf Asylum, rather with Anderson herself. Anderson appeared to go along with it afterwards. Lord Mountbatten, a first cousin of the Romanov children, thought her supporters simply got rich on the royalties from further books and magazine articles. Prince Michael Romanov a grandson of Grand Duchess Xenia Alexandrovna of Russia, stated the Romanov family always knew Anderson was a fraud, and that the family looked upon her and what he described as the three-ringed circus which danced around her, creating books and movies, as a vulgar insult to the memory of the imperial family. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoy the content we produce here at Heart for History, please like and subscribe. And please feel free to leave a comment, as your feedback is greatly appreciated. Thanks again, and we'll see you again soon.